So hello everyone, thanks for being here for the HOPE intervention. We planned for this to be 10 minutes of sort of education about the science of HOPE, 10 minutes of the actual intervention part or the part that's the activity, which is this time of meditation, and then 10 minutes of question and answers. So we'll go very quickly, but hopefully very um, useful. We'll see, this is the first time I'm doing this. And it just came into my head on Wednesday morning that I needed to do this. I've, my name's Julia Mossbridge. My background's in, I'm a scientist and my background's in time and time perception. I come at hope from the angle of most of my life being fascinated with my own relationship with my future self and having early experiences that I survived and, and actually ended up thriving, even though there are difficult experiences um, I think partly due to a very robust relationship with my future self, which I'll talk about later. But uh, that's, that's what brings me here and the study of time and, and human beings' relationship to their, their future and, and time itself. And I'm here with Dr. Michael Sapiro, who will introduce himself at the beginning of the meditation section. He's a meditation teacher and researcher and, and a clinical psychologist. So we come at this from very different angles, but we're very simpatico on our approaches. So I'd like to share my screen. I have a presentation. Here we go. And this is an Office Libre, which I just downloaded. And looks, looks like that's working. Good, hopefully you're seeing my screen. Okay, here we go. Michael, um, would you text me on my phone if people are not seeing my screen? Okay, here we are. So I um, first want to say that I'm the executive director of this nonprofit called the Institute for Love and Time or TILT. You can learn more about it at gotilt.org. And we're focused uh, right now, especially on a project where we're trying to increase future orientation around the world and specifically in the United States. And so I'll talk a little bit about future orientation. In fact, I'll talk a lot about future orientation. So um, I'm grateful to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that has funded um, a portion, a large portion of that project. So I'm not asking for money. And, and actually, if you're thinking about uh, donating, your dollars will go towards better towards a food pantry or another organization right now that needs uh, your money. We are funded for this project. Um, and so thank you very much. You're welcome to learn about the organization. If you want to look at other projects, that's great. So what I hope to talk about today <laughs> is that hope, I believe, is a public health issue that is under-recognized. I also believe it's a personal health issue that's under-recognized. And in fact, I kind of think of it as the, this time in our history as the time when before we really got it that we all need to be doing hope workouts every day, kind of like we know that we're supposed to be exercising physically every day. And eventually this will be clear and people will um, just put this into their daily routines. But right now, I think there, there needs to be a hope intervention. And so that's why I believe this is important. So just some terminology for those who like this. Um, otherwise you could just sort of sail through this until the meditation. So future orientation is a scientific term that I believe is approaches hope. So a future orientation is the extent to which a person habitually hopes for, plans, and prepares to meet future goals. So you can think of it as your time horizon over which you are extending yourself and making a plan for yourself and being motivated by your future self. And a hope would be kind of equivalent to a robust future orientation. So it's future-based optimism. Um, you might have faith. You might have intentions and plans that support your future thriving. And we know that a robust future orientation is extensive in that it extends over months and years, um, not just minutes or days, but you gotta start somewhere. It's adaptive, so it's flexible, it's realistic. It's not, um, well, so my orient future orientation is that tomorrow I'll win the lottery. Uh, it's more like, let's take the information in about what's actually happening and then we'll make plans and goals and intentions and have faith around that. Um, 
and it's habitual. It's mostly unconscious. A, a robust future orientation is actually, I noticed when I was a kid um, in a situation where there were lots of high socioeconomic status people around me, um, that a robust future orientation is taught almost unconsciously by parents um, who are well educated and have high resources uh, to their kids. So uh, it's very interesting. We'll talk more about that. Very excited about this um, meta-analysis that came up from some re researchers at the University of Amsterdam in 2018. They looked at 77 studies of 31,558 people. This is their model, their psychological model they were looking at. On the left, you have the future time perspective, which is um, another name for future orientation, different kinds of constructs. The kind of focus, whether it's specific, like tomorrow I'm going to work out to increase my physical health, or general, I generally like to do things in the future that support my thriving. And then the outcomes are education, work, and health. The reason there's a red square around the mixture of cognition, behavioral intention, and affect is because thinking, intentions to do something, and feelings are the things that were most specifically linked in the end to education, work, and health outcomes. So um, for those of you who like tables, um, here's a table with red boxes around the effect sizes which all are, around, are all around 0.2-ish, um, and the p-values, which show that in each case for education, work, and health, there seems to be a significant relationship between overall future time perspective or future orientation and the outcome. The reason there's a box around the effect size is to remind me to tell you that this effect size at around 0.2 is about the same as the link between um, cholesterol or bad cholesterol and uh, the cardiovascular status. So there's definitely other factors going on. It's not a huge link, but it's something that you could potentially control. And just to point out, this is a correlational study. Causation we're gonna talk about later, but there are studies showing causation as well. So what we know from other studies and, and from, partly from that study is that a strong future orientation happens at a time in your life when you're mentally healthy, when you have high socioeconomic status, when you have addictions that are acceptable. And the reason I say acceptable addictions rather than no addictions is because um, most of us um, have one type of addiction or another, and maybe it's a work addiction, or maybe it's an addiction to money, or maybe it's addiction to your phone, and these are largely acceptable. Um, or maybe it's an addiction to drugs or alcohol or sex, and these are less acceptable. Um, when you're feeling physically healthy, when you're connected to community. So these, there's studies supporting all of these as uh, predicting a strong future orientation. So let's talk about when people have a weak future orientation, when they're not feeling mentally healthy, or if they have been diagnosed with a mental illness if they have low socioeconomic status, if they have an unacceptable addiction or even an acceptable addiction socially that's uh, hurting their life regardless of its acceptability. When they're not physically healthy, so when you're sick, your future orientation goes down. This all makes sense, right? Your future orientation is clearly gonna be partially linked to what's happening in your life your expectations about what's gonna happen in the future match what's happening in the past, but not always, and we'll talk about that. So, or if you're not feeling connected to your community. So in this case, this guy is with his dog, which is not enough. So being connected to a community of humans. So notice that each of these pieces, now with um, what we're going through with coronavirus, each of these pieces is going to represent a larger percentage of the population. And certainly some people who are here today can relate to at least one of these pieces, either in their past or their present or their potential future. So, um, so hope is a public health issue. And I, I hope that it's clear that hope is a personal health issue in that you or someone you love or someone you work with might be having one of those experiences or might have had or, or have one of those experiences in the future. So then I wanna talk about briefly that there is a hope workout and it, that works and that you can do. So many people relate to their future selves 
like this person on the left or this person on the right. So the person on the left doesn't even have, a, they have all these sort of steps before them that doesn't, they don't have, they're not in the picture. They don't see themselves there. So they, they're not willing or they don't have practice in seeing themselves in the future. That might be people in this room. I'm sure in my life it's been me sometimes. On the right hand side, this person sees themselves in the future, but it's, it's an upside down version of themselves. It doesn't, it's too far removed from themselves. It's almost like a different person. In fact, there are studies looking at uh, brain activity uh, when someone is thinking about their future self and oftentimes uh, the areas of the brain that relate to thinking about someone else rather than thinking about yourself end up lighting up. This is a, a distant relationship with your future self. You also might have a closer relationship with your future self, but you might be blinding each other in the sense of you might be not letting yourself connect. So you might say, yeah, that's me over there, but um, we're not going to look at the world correctly. We're not going to get accurate information and we're not going to help each other out. For fear of, for instance, being delusional, like my future self doesn't exist yet, so it, it's crazy to think that I can connect with my future self instead of allowing yourself to imagine. Just like we imagined, for instance, in the past, yesterday's self. Uh, frankly, there's no proof that yesterday's self exists except maybe a video, but you can't prove to anyone that that actually happened yesterday. So we, are, we think it's perfectly normal to agree that yesterday's self existed. Tomorrow's self, there can be no video of, but we get to imagine it just like we can imagine a memory. And that's what I want to talk with you about is the relationship with your future self. That's the hope workout is enhancing that. I'll give you some evidence for that in a second, but just different examples of the relationship with your future self. You could be doing parallel play. You could both be keeping each other company, doing the same kind of thing. You could be looking at each other and appreciating each other and loving each other. You could be looking back on your life together and saying, look what we did. In other words, it's a way to connect with yourself over time so that you're not alone and especially helpful in a situation where you don't know if there's anyone else you can trust or if you are physically alone. So multiple studies, and we can talk about these at future um, sessions, um, multiple studies show that your connection with your future self can be strengthened with practice, leads to increasing your future orientation, which I'm calling equivalent to hope, essentially, or at least a robust future orientation, seems equivalent to hope to me and it improves well-being, and in some cases, physical health. So this is something that we ought to be doing. Oh, and here's, right, so I talked about the causal, I said I was going to talk about the causal stuff later. Here's a graph showing a, a longitudinal relationship, a 10-year, I'm sorry, longitudinal study, a 10-year study of the relationship between people's um, past and future selves, or depending on how you look at it, present and future selves. Um, in 1995, they were asked, what's the similarity between your future self and the current self on various different uh, metrics? You know, what is the personality like? What are the feelings like, et cetera? And on the, on the y-axis, you have the life satisfaction 10 years later. Life satisfaction controlling for the initial life satisfaction in 1995 was significantly correlated with your perceived similarity between your present and your future self. In other words, the more connected in time you felt to your future, regardless of your life satisfaction in 1995, the more life satisfaction you had in 2005. Really cool study. So I hope uh, this brief introduction to the science of hope, <laughs> I hope has created in you this idea that it's really okay to work on connecting with an imagined future self that's wiser, it's by default wiser, because it, even if it's five minutes from now, it's five minutes smarter than you are right now. And, and that could actually support you. Uh, just briefly, my own experience when I was a kid and going through trauma, I imagined my future self at around the age of 40, um, just looking at me and supporting me. And then when I was at the age of 40, I did some exercises to go back and imagine that I could support myself. It's very helpful. Uh, more about that later if, if you want. Uh, for those who want to treat this as a class, you can do homework this week experiment with one hope workout and we'll be sending out um, a meditation by michael that you could use as your hope workout or you can try another hope workout such as writing a letter to yourself from your future self or you can try um, 
in the morning recording a note to your, or typing out a note, I like to do this on my phone, to your evening time self and then listening to it. And then in your evening time, making another note for your morning self, making this connection across time. So thanks for listening. And now I'd like to pass this over to Dr. Michael Sapiro, my wonderful friend and colleague on this, on this uh, future orientation project, who will lead us in a meditation. Okay, and now I have to find Michael so I can unmute him. Michael, can you unmute yourself? There you are. There we go. Okay, great. I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks, Michael. That was funny. I, I was thinking how much my wife would love to have a mute button. Let me see. Can you guys hear me? For me? <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. How, how good is it to be in a community, even virtually, right now, with each other? Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Mike, or Michael Sapiro. I'm a clinical psychologist, meditation teacher. Um, I teach the art and science of transformation. And a part of that is learning to have a, a, a truly loving relationship to ourselves the self we've grown through, lived in, the body we've lived in, the mind and spirit, and the, the self that's in, ahead of us, whatever that means or looks like. So the work I do is with patients or large groups, um, uh, opening the gate of the heart to include all versions of our self, because truly we, we, it's very hard to get the type of love we need from others if we're not doing it and giving it and feeling it in ourselves. So we're going to do a meditation that introduces this concept in the felt sense in the body. So I'd like to encourage you to um, find a position or posture that's comfortable. We're going to pretty much start in a few moments, actually. Um, if that means being in a posture that's not rigid, but that's firm. The shoulders might be back and down. I encourage you to uh, close your eyes if you'd like. You're welcome to close your eyes, bring your hands to your lap, on the knees, on the, by the belly. And if you're really needing deep connection to yourself, you might think about bringing your hands to the heart and to the belly. Here we are all together as a group. Let's take a deep breath in and sigh. And this next sigh, sigh into the body, inhale and sigh so drop your attention into the body as if getting into a warm bath or under the covers let the mind rest in the body as the body rests on the chair or the cushion or the couch Begin to breathe slowly and deeply through the nose into the body. And in your mind, tell yourself slow and steady. Slow and steady. And feel your body's response. You might tell yourself, it's okay to rest. It's okay to rest. As the mind wanders, as it tends to do, gently guide your attention back to the body breathing. 
Rest your mind gently on the body breathing. And feel the vibrant sensations of the body, the body alive with sensation. Notice any feelings like tension, tightness, restlessness, energy, ease, calm. Just notice. And breathe into this experience. And now bring your attention up behind the eyes, deep behind the eyes, to the center of the brain. Imagine seeing a huge screen in front of you or the infinite space of imagination in the mind. And think of a time in your past, it could be yesterday, it could be years ago, where you were struggling. So picture yourself in that situation, not the worst of them, but just a time you were struggling. And notice how your body feels as you see yourself struggling. And right now, bring up a sense of compassion for yourself, that struggling, suffering self. And feel a sense of love radiating from you to the self that was suffering, struggling. You might tell yourself, I know it was hard. I see you. And I love you. What message would you like to tell yourself, looking at yourself struggling or suffering? Right here, what message would you like to tell yourself? the self that was suffering. Allow this connection between you, within you, to be bolstered by love, radiating love. And allow this image to drop, return to the body breathing, ground in the breath. And now imagine yourself in the future could be 10 minutes from now or 10 years. Picture yourself in the future. What are you wearing? What are you doing? Let your heart imagine your future for you. Imagine your future self turning and looking at you. Radiating love towards you. And you radiating love towards you.
what message does your future self have for you? What does she or he say to you? And feel your body's response. Thank your future self, sending love, receiving love. Just feel your body, the response. Breathe into this body now, here. Fully alive. Ground in this very moment. Opening your awareness wide around you. to sound, color and light, sensations. Just being. Notice life living itself through your awareness. I would like to end this practice with a poem by Wendell Berry. Just stay in open presence, loving awareness. I Go Among Trees by Wendell Berry. I go among trees and sit still. All my stirring becomes quiet around me like circles on water. My tasks lie in their places where I left them, asleep like cattle. Then what is afraid of me comes and lives a while in my sight. What it fears in me leaves me, and the fear of me leaves it. It sings, and I hear its song. Then what I am afraid of comes. I live for a while in its sight. What I fear in it leaves it, and the fear of it leaves me. It sings and I hear its song. After days of labor, mute in my consternations, I hear my song at last and I sing it. As we sing, the day turns, the trees move. So take a full deep breath into this radiant body of love. Mm. One more deep breath into this radiant body of love. And without losing this embodied mindfulness and loving awareness, just gently open the eyes, coming back to this group together. And thank you for practicing with me.
thanks, Dr. Sapiro. I'm going to have to call you Michael because I can't keep up this um, formality thing. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> okay. Um, so turns out Michael and I both can't keep ourselves to under 15 minutes. And so it is now the end of sort of the presentation part. But because to be fair with everyone else, I'm going to make an executive decision to just make the question and answer section also 15 minutes. So those who want to stay, We'll go to 8.45 um, Pacific time, which is 15 minutes from now, for questions and answers. A few notes on questions and answers. Um, so generally, when I've run these things before, there are some questions that people ask that are on the order of, do you know this person who does this work? I should introduce you because you would really like it. Or have you ever thought of doing this experiment? Or those kind of things. Those are great and wonderful and much appreciated, but better for um, sending to an email to either Michael or myself, you can reach us both at gotilt.org in the contact form. When you're asking questions in the chat window, uh, consider at, check in with your future self and see, <laughs> is this a question that people who are watching the YouTube video and other people will benefit from? Um, in other words, is it a question that really is currently in the present moment percolating in your mind in your curiosity? Um, that kind of thing is what we're going for here. Um, and I hope I just haven't discouraged everyone from, answer, uh, from asking questions. <laughs> so please also just ask the question you want to ask and we can filter them. Okay, great. So we have a question. Um, I won't be saying people's names who ask questions just because some people want to remain private. So um, someone teaches a similar future self exercise in their practice and wants to have me explain the difference between the higher self and the future self. So I don't know enough to know if there's a difference. I can I conceptualize them differently, but it's other people will conceptualize them as the same. The future self seems to me to be a more scientific term um, in the sense that we have a past self. In other words, we consider it adaptive to, in our lives, connect with our past selves. And we, in fact, we consider it maladaptive if you wake up every morning and say, um, oh my gosh, what's going on? I don't know where I am and I don't have any memory of who I am and what's happening. That's considered maladaptive, right? Um, however, we tend not to emphasize the future self part. So I think of the future self as just the temporarily reverse version of, of our past connectivity. The higher self is this new age concept that I know what you mean when you're talking about it. And I, I associate it with... Um, in the psychological literature, I associate it with the superconscious that Roberto Asagioli talked about, who was a student of uh, Freud, and who said, "I'm sick of all the pathology stuff. I want to have a section of the of the of the psyche that's actually really helpful and and guides people with wisdom." Um, and so he created this idea of the superconscious that that guides people. And so I kind of think of that as the higher self. I do think that the superconscious, if you want to believe in that as part of the psyche or name that as part of the psyche, can sort of call people forward um, and act as a, as, as a future self. I think there's a lot of complexity there and I'm, and I'm not sure how much the different constructs actually help people. So I'm, I find myself perched, you know, my background's in cognitive neuroscience and basic research and I'm moving much towards application. And I find myself perched in this transitional or translational zone where I'm not sure how much of a difference it makes. If you help people by talking about the higher self, then just you know keep doing that right and maybe you might want to incorporate some of the hope workouts that we're talking about over the course of of this series into your practice and you could just change the name to higher self if that's what reaches your people frankly who knows right i mean no one's figured out life and certainly not one thing works for everyone so <laughs> is that vague and, and totally full of caveats enough for you okay um hey michael are you still uh, unmuted? No, I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to unmute you. Am I here? Do you hear me? Yeah. Can I just want to res. Oh. Yeah, you want to respond to the last one. Great. Yeah, just just briefly, for me, as a non-dual meditation teacher and 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 a Buddhist student teacher, they're 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 simultaneously existing. We have to refine our humanness with speech our right speech, you know, looking into the future to see what would my wise future self tell me to do in this moment, or how can I embody this wise future self that's in the future while underlying knowing we 
are already whole and unbroken, even now, even then, even where we're coming from. There's an unbroken chain of innate goodness that never leaves us, and yet we're learning and growing as a human being toward the future. So if you can have a robust, healthy vision of a wise future, our loving self, you can emulate her and him in the present moment. Everything for me comes to the present moment. I'm bringing my future self to the present moment, bringing him into my body so I can act and be like him because that's who I want to become while knowing underlying we have innate goodness that radiates at all times. Cool. Excellent. Okay. And, and there's another question I wanted to really quickly get to because it's a logistical question. Is this an ongoing series? Yes, Michael and I have the response to this was so overwhelming that we decided to make this an ongoing series where we do um, a meditation type, type thing, a scientific blurb thing, and question and answers. We'll try to do it every week. And everyone on this list, um, if, if you haven't received an email from me, um, shoot me an email through gotilt.org and I'll put you on the list and you'll get an announcement about it. Um, so there's a, there's a question. Can you speak to being in the present and the present self and all that implies with a future self orientation? Right. So there's this idea of being in the present or the moment of now being special and being presenting is very important. Being present is of course very important. Getting this information right here about what it feels in our body and, and our minds and everything else, whatever you want to call it to be here is really important. But so, okay, that's why I have my pearls out because I thought someone might ask this question. So I never actually wear these pearls, but um, they're great as a metaphor. So this big pearl in, in the middle, let's imagine that's the present. This is our present moment. It's surrounded by the past and the future moments going out like this. And our, this, we're always experiencing the now as this special thing, that, but it also we're also experiencing it moving along in time. So now is special in that it's the only thing that we have evidence for ever is the now, right? That's very special. And at the same time, there has to be this relationship and, 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 this, and so my experience is that by being more present to the now, you also are somehow capable of being connected. It's like if, if I'm that linchpin, if I'm that middle pearl, then I also somehow over time, and this also the pearls don't do this justice because it kind of has to move in time and space. But anyway, what happens is, I'll throw the pearls away for a second. If this is the present, this is the future, this is the past, it's like each moment becomes strengthened and through the strengthening of connecting to these other moments, you, the moments start to drift away and you become the thread, which is an extremely strong position to be in. So I'm no longer dependent on each of those moments in my life to define who I am. I'm actually, I'm actually the string that connects them. So it's like I'm the essence. I'm, I'm no longer those objects. It's a very powerful um, and sort of radical position to be in, but it's um, delightful and very helpful. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that, Michael? Or yeah, I mean, we have language for it, unity consciousness. We have cosmic consciousness. It's when you really become the thing that holds all of existence, that we become the container for it, which includes all moments past and present, which is why it becomes so powerful because we're so tightly connected to who we think we are uh, and we're kind of holding on desperately and bonded to usually what, how we're suffering. And when we see the greater, bigger picture that we really truly are, we can let go of the bonds to this tight self that we think we are and really experience uh, a greater version of ourselves, which we are in, we we're all connected in every single moment to past, present, future, and to each other and to the earth and to the cosmos and whatever else, it's all there. But we are very limited because we believe we're just this thing uh, going from backwards to this moment and all that stuff we've been through. Um, and it's hard to see the future, but it's all, it's all, it's all here now. And like, I like what Julia said, once we expand, it becomes a much more powerful stance of I am all of this and more. Yeah, physicists talk about a world line, you know, the moment a uh, particle uh, comes, into, comes into existence and the moment that it goes out of existence, as if that's true, um, is all the places in space time where that particle was. And so if you think of yourself as that particle, you know, from the moment of your birth to the moment of your death, and you're all of that, that's, that's much more powerful because you don't have to be everything all at once. So today I'm scared. But tomorrow I maybe have a different experience. But if I'm all of that, I get to be all of that stronger. I wanna to get to the question here and specifically I wanna to get to it because I will out my mother for asking it. Um, I know she won't mind. <laughs> the question is, um, so what's a false hope, right? Could you, have, could you 
have a fantasy of your future self saying, oh, everything's wonderful, da 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 and it's a lie, and then you're disappointed. So my experience with really going into a meditative state like the one uh, Michael took us into and connecting with my future self is that it's never this, never this experience of, um, oh, let me tell you all the prizes you've won. <laughs> It's just, it's just love. It's just this connection of just like when I was a little girl and that future self appeared, she wouldn't, she wasn't telling me all the things that were happening to me that were traumatic weren't happening. She wasn't saying, Oh, this is okay. This is fine. This is not a problem. In fact, she was saying, um, this sucks. This is hard. You're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. But this is hard right now. It makes sense that you're having a hard time. It makes sense that you're in pain. In other words, it's a real connection. This person's not that different from you. That's why it's, I think, very helpful if you're concerned about false hopes. Start by connecting. If you do the hope homework, start by making a hope workout for yourself that's literally five minutes in the future. Then move to 10 minutes in the future and start to string it out the horizon. Michael, did you want to comment on that? No, I, I think that's... I think what I found with all my patients, myself and the groups is it's really love coming back at you. It's like the father, mother, we, we always had or wish we had or within ourselves that wise kind of loving archetype that looks back and says, you're going to be all right if here's the practices. I always hear practices. Be patient. You know, uh, hold tight. You know, find friends. You know, the future self is always telling me something that if I practice will lead me to that future place. And it's usually wisdom speaking. So I, I've never also seen something that shows me big houses and cars and go, you're going to make this happen. It's usually when I'm struggling, the future self going, here's how you can get to this place. And so I encourage all of you to do these meditations often because you're going to get a stronger sense of your innate wisdom speaking to you from the future because it may be hard to access right now in the present when we're struggling and suffering so much or we're anxious or we're fearful, it's hard to access what the future self can give us, which is your innate wisdom back at you. Yeah. And that made me reminded me of something, Michael's and also someone asked, how does love shape all of this? Yeah, yeah. So, so just super quickly, unconditional love is, um, one of my research topics and one, it's something that Michael researches as well. So we're both into it. And, and we both noticed that it's something that seems to, I'm doing this with my hands to show that it's, <laughs> what am I trying to say with my hands to show that it's um, sort of down here. It's like beyond, it's sort of beneath the head, but it's also beyond time and space. It's beyond the separation that we have. There's a you, there's a me, unconditional love transcends this. There's a now, there's a then, unconditional love transcends, transcends this. It's transcending separation in time and space. So, um, so it shapes all of it to answer the question of how does love shape this. And um, when you're starting out with this, the way Michael did that meditation where he looked backwards first and sent love is a very helpful way if you don't trust your future self to send you love. Like some people are in a relationship with their future self where they don't want to look and I get that because of their history and I have been in that place. It really helps to just go, oh, I'm going to go do a meditation where I send my past self love. And then you see, wait, I'm the future self for that past. And I sent me love. Therefore, my future self was very much like me. Five minutes from now can send me love. So you start to mm. be the model for yourself of how to do it. Mm. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, there's other questions about how time works and all that stuff, which um, are less applications oriented and very interesting, more basic research oriented, but that's more like physics stuff and I think we should leave that out for now. I have us at about a minute left. Yeah, so I think you know, we have a minute purposes. left. In yeah. fact, I think we're done. So I think we better say goodbye and let people have their days. Have a wonderful yeah, weekend. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you soon. And I'll send this recording to everyone on the list.